If you've been anywhere in the North Island this month, you'll know that clear skies can be rare and precious. Today, James Shepard will outline approaches that maximise the value of data collected from regular satellite imagery, regardless of the weather. James is a senior scientist in the remote sensing team at Manaki Whenua, and his work has encompassed pretty much everything you can see from satellites, as well as the clouds. I'll be back at the end for Q&A. Um, over to you now, James. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to go through today uh, a talk about how we've gone through the issues of clouds and dealing with improving satellite imagery to a point we can use it for a variety of use cases. Um, okay, there's my first slide. Um, so essentially, I'm going to go through a paper, a couple of recent papers I wanted to point out. We've of recent times, we've decided to start publishing in open source journals. So if you need any more detail around the sort of things I'm talking about today, it's present in these two papers that I'm going to cover. But specifically this paper here, the automated mosaicing of Sentinel-2 satellite imagery. The, um, the links are there for you to download those directly if you need any more information. Um, to start with though, I thought it might be useful because a lot of you might know about Sentinel-2 satellite imagery, and I thought it might be useful to sort of talk about why we do our own work and run our own archives when a lot of people can download this data globally of things like Google Earth Engine. And I guess it's built on a history of remote sensing in New Zealand, and I'm just not going to dwell on all the papers that have sort of got us to where we are today, but it does sort of paint a picture as to sort of the type of analysis ready products we provide. Um, so that's the kind of backstory there in those papers. Um, just New Zealand is a rugged country, there's a lot of steep topography and we found in some 20, 25 years ago that we needed to look at how we could deal with this. So we started doing some work where we tried to understand how light was reflected off vegetation canopies. We did some measurements on homogeneous vegetation canopies and we fitted models to these measurements to enable us to understand how different angles of view and different angles of topography affected um, the reflectance you see. And what that has enabled us to do is to take satellite imagery as you see here, this is the Rimataka area, and this is prior to the Sentinel data, this is actually Landsat data, this work was done earlier, and we were able to apply these algorithms, get hold of terrain information, and run processing that enables us to flatten out the symmetry. Now, the reason we want to remove this effect of topography is because we want the computer to classify the colors in the imagery, not so much the aspect that you see. So, what this means though is that we sort of have two analysis ready products. We have one where the terrain, we apply atmospheric correction, but we leave the terrain in and we minimize the clouds. So this is more a product that you might look at manually. And then we have standardized reflectance products like this for the country, which we feed to computers to classify. Um, where there are clouds in that product, we leave those as empty areas. I'll just show another example of this topographic correction. Um, so this is the initial image and then we apply the correction. You can see it, it's really helpful sometimes to remove the, be able to remove the effect and angular effect of this, where the sun, the local sun elevation is. And so you can see where the shrub finishes and where the pasture, where the pasture is. So that's, that gives you a feel for the type of work that means these sort of algorithms are not currently employed in other platforms, the type of atmospheric correction we do and the type of topographic correction we do. So we that's that's one reason why we want to do our own processing and have our own archive. So in 2015, along came Sentinel-2. Um, it's been a real step change in the things we're able to do because we used to have to spend quite a lot on satellite imagery. And this has become freely available at what they call medium resolution and 10 meter resolution. 
and actually has 10 spectral bands. And so it's been quite an interesting change. When they initially released the Sentinel data, they talked about how it might only be in their archives for three months. So we were worried about that. So we started the process of downloading all possible data and, and archiving it. And so we've kind of followed up that process because we want to be in control of the data and ensure it never gets lost. So that's sort of another reason why we run our own archive. So I'm going to step through now and show you uh, some of that data. Um, when Sentinel goes over New Zealand, it, it gets essentially put in five strips over the mainland New Zealand, and there's a couple of strips here over, over the Chatham. So this, this is the kind of framework in which we look at New Zealand with the Sentinel data. So we're doing these sort of strip strips. Um, so this is what the data looked like for last summer, for the 22-23 summer. This is that first strip here, R115. And I'll just go through, oh, I should explain the colors to some extent. We're not actually looking in a visible color scheme. Um, we're looking in a different color that gives us more kind of discrimination. We're looking at Rather than red, green, and blue, we're looking at red, near infrared, and shortwave infrared. Um, so what happens there is the clouds and snow appear sort of well. The snow appears pink. The clouds appear either pink or white. And then there's a, a much more interesting colour range inside the vegetation. But anyway, that the point of these is to show how many options there are that we need to process over a summer. So that's the first strip, uh, second the central strip um, through Bay of Plenty down to Wellington, and then finally East Cape. And we mustn't sort of forget the Chathams either. And we're lucky in the Chathams that the, the two overlying strips give us full coverage twice, which we certainly need because it's very cloudy. So the, the point of seeing these is there's hundreds of potential options of these strips of data and that most of them are very cloudy. So somehow we have to process through that and extract the stuff we can use. Um, in doing that, what we have, when the data gets delivered to us, it gets in these granules, these sort of, um, if you like, kind of yellow squares I've demonstrated here. Um, we prefer to Rather than processing granules, which you'll see in other places, we prefer to leave it in these strips because it, each one is on a particular day. And so you see the full level of observations in one image on one day. Um, the other thing we've done in the data in an effort to save space is that we've clipped all the data. You might have noticed here, all the data is clipped to the ocean. So there's no actual clouds or data outside the land area. So we have a 500 meter buffer here in gray, and we sort of do that to try and save space in our archive. Even so, um, currently on the Nessie computer, the supercomputer at Wellington, there's 26 terabytes of the original archives that we got from European Space Agency. Um, that unpacks into 50,000 odd granules each about 100 by 100 Ks. And when we process the data, as I'm about to show you, it blows up. There's another 84 terabytes of currently processed data and 3,300 odd strips. So it's a huge amount of data to deal with. And we're trying to do good cloud classification so that we can pull out the stuff we can use. So here's a slide that's a, that demonstrates the whole cloud clearing process. It's, it's from the paper. Um, we don't need to talk about this in great detail, I guess, I guess you can see in the paper, but the point is that there's two work streams. The first work stream is single date cloud classification, more traditional cloud classification. So we find clouds, we look for their shadows, and we that's a pixel-based process, and then we segment the imagery and pull out segments that contain classified pixels. So we sort of um, take the majority of a segment and classify it. So it snaps the snaps it to objects rather than pixels. So we get an initial cloud and cloud shadow mask that's reasonably accurate, but not, not quite good enough for what we need. After that, we have all these initial single date masks. We actually throw them all together, and then we fit the sinu these sinusoidal functions 
for three years through every pixel. And the reason we do that is so we can have information about the so business as usual reflectance behavior of that pixel so that then we can go and find out whether or not a, it's brighter or darker than we are expecting and therefore it's likely to be a cloud or cloud shadow. Incidentally, the cloud shadows are, are actually far more difficult to deal with than the clouds. At least they are sort of bright often, but the cloud shadows can be quite hard to separate from dark forest or water. So this kind of complicated looking sinusoidal function basically just finds the average reflectance plus uh, terms for the variation through a year and then terms for the variation across three years. And so that's what that looks like here. This is one pixel of the whole record here, um, down here on the right, in three bands. So we have the green band there, then what the near infrared band looked through over that three years, and what the shortwave band looked like in those three years. And what, what we have there, the red pixels are the pixels that are near what we would expect. Um, and so they are kept, the white, the white circles are clouds, and the black, black circles are shadows. And different bands are used for different parts, you see. So in the, the primarily clouds come from the visible, and you can see those white circles are all above the line there. But there are some dark circles that are still above the line because the shadows get classified from the near infrared and shortwave infrared parts. So we, we take three years worth of data of a single cloud mask, we fit curves to it, and we produce these um, images, if you like, of coefficients of, of, of that function we saw before. So you have, this is what this is an example of coefficients in the green, near infrared, and shortwave infrared. And so that gives us the information we need to go ahead and classify, just in this function here, pull, pull out these brighter or darker areas than expected. And that's called this T-mask process and clip those again using segments in the imagery. And then finally, we do a, a check to make sure that the things we have found make sense, that, that clouds have shadows and shadows have clouds, that, that type of thing to make sure we're not picking up ch real change as opposed to clouds. So that's, that's that kind of TMAS process. Um, I did wanna show you another important bit of the process, which is the second paper which is this, this segmentation we developed to help us be able to have free and fast object recognition within images. So this, this, this second paper here, which again is available, what I'm trying to show here with this movie, we, we do an initial classification of the image and there's 176,000 segments. And then this iterative elimination happens at, on, on the right there and, and the the smaller segments that we want to remove get absorbed into their neighbors as we go from one pixel up to a hectare. And that what that means is we end up with only a few thousand segments, but the image still looks very similar to what we started with. So that gives us something practical and object-based we can work with. So because that's, that is freely available and fast and we can run it on the supercomputer, every, every granule of those 50,000 comes in and we do object-based segmentation on the on the imagery here. So on the left is a particular granule um, in, in the sort of Kuiper Auckland area. This is very typical, quite cloudy. And on the right is 300,000 segments that have been derived from that image that we can use. So I'm just gonna zoom in here on this little red area so we can show a little bit about how that cloud uh, process works. So again, on the left here is a sort of typical image um, near Auckland and in Waitakere, and we've got a variety of clouds there. And on the right is the sort of features we have that are each of them is an, an area of similar color in the image on the left. So that those are the features we have. So we apply one of these pixel-based methods to classify cloud, and we end up with a, a process that looks a bit like this. And it's, not, it's a pretty good start in terms of, so we have, what we have here is the magenta areas are cloud, the yellow areas are cloud shadow, um, 
the black areas are no cloud according to the classification and the blue is water. As, as you can see, that's not a bad start, but it's not nearly perfect. But when we apply these segments then and, and snap, if you like, by majority, some of this pixel data to a given segment, it produces a much more useful result. So we end up with a, a, a much closer to real looking piece of cloud masking without just using generic buffering, which would just sort of waste useful cloud free area. One thing we is a challenge here is trying to, amongst all these clouds, ensure we still get useful pixels, but, but not end up with a whole lot of cloud contamination. So that's, that gives an example as to why we want that second paper and the techniques there, because we want to be able to use object-based fast and, and free. So that's, we wrote our own bit of work for that. Now I will show you what this sort of looks like in a typical strip. Um, this is directly again from that first paper. So this is a strip, the middle strip in, across New Zealand. That's, a, a, as I said, very typical. In fact, that's not even particularly cloudy at, in terms of there's quite a lot of useful area that we, we can use, but it's just not practical to um, digitize around the clouds. We need automated methods. So this is, I'm just going to show you now um, what the, our cloud mask looks like for that, that inset area in red. And so the result looks like that. So we end up with information, like I showed you before, with magenta for cloud, um, the yellow for cloud shadow. And so what that means is we have, for each of those strips that I showed you before, and we have this collection of this, the original data, and then we have this collection of masks. And these masks are the, this is the key bit of information really, that we can then use to start. So what we're trying to do here is basically try and collect together the best bits of the gray and in, in all these mosaics, uh, sorry, all these strips. Um, yeah, it sort of looks like there's quite a lot of useful cloud free area when you look at it like that. But when you actually see the classified area, there's not a heck of a lot of gray available to us. A few good scenes and then we have to piece the, the rest together. So the, basically, this bit's described in the paper, but we need to um, prioritize which image goes in first and how we build up this, this mosaic. And this is a different sort of process to some mosaicing processes which might use median by pixel or something. This is a process where you actually want to know for each, each pixel what date it came from and, and have kind of useful so we can actually treat it as a measurement for mapping exercises. So when we um, basically go through a process of prioritizing which masks go get built up into what we call a control mask. So what we have here is the control mask on the left. So this is where we have prioritized all the possible image strips into this raster, which then drives the generation of the mosaic on the right. Um, there's two methods for prioritizing that we use. Um, one of them is sort of prioritizing for quality, where we, we try and put the image with the highest sun angle and contributing area in first. And that's why you see some quite big pieces in there first. Um, and the other pro way of doing it, um, which some clients want, is prioritizing for date. And so rather than putting the highest quality in or the biggest biggest piece in first or most contributing, we'll put the one closest to the date of interest. For a lot of um, change work, that might be the end of the calendar year, for example. So it sort of looks, that, that mask on the left looks like it's fairly simple. Um, you see sort of a few different colors, but there's actually something like just under 200 strips that get put in as possibility for New Zealand. And typically, whenever we do these mosaics for New Zealand, we end up with a, at least of the order of 100 different contributing images. So I'm just going to zoom in a bit to show you sort of how that works. So as I zoom in, we'll zoom in on the same part of the mosaic. So here we have the South Island. You start to see there's quite a few different dates, dates here, yet the image looks 
like it's sort of one date. And here, here we are on the west coast. You can see even as we have resumed in here, this is, is actually lots and lots of different images that have contributed to this. And yet the mosaics we produce look fairly consistent. And that's really the goal, to be able to look at the mosaic for one summer and get a consistent product that people can use and we can classify. But, but it, be able to piece together, as you can see here, lots of gaps between lots of clouds, as you might expect on the west coast. I've got another example in Northland, because Northland's also traditionally a very difficult place for clouds. Um, and this is quite typical. Um, it will just zoom in a bit here towards Do Doubtless Bay area. You can see this is a typical, quite complicated cloud pattern that's been produced by that cloud masking. And it would be very difficult, perhaps not really practical to draw around all these by hand or any other sorts of methods. So we really do have needed these methods to be able to produce these, these um, mosaics here um, on the on the right. Um, so that basically gives you a feel for the how each mosaic is built. We're able to build mosaics at any time of year, but it typically and historically the mosaics have been built over the summer period because that's the highest sun angles and, and sort of least cloud. And we end up, because we've got a lot of topography, we end up with better quality imagery in the steep slopes. So um, that's kind of described what the control mask looks like. And I'm sort of, this is getting close to the end of the, the process. So this is the situation that we have now. Um, we have produced, each summer we produce a cloud-free mosaic. Um, we produce it in both uh, cloud minimized with topography remaining and then in standardized reflectance. So it looks flat that we can process to the computer. Um, we've processed, typically we, we, for any of our mapping exercises, it's all, all of New Zealand, so there's Chathams included here as well. And currently, as you can see there, we've, it's actually been quite a, we're already getting quite a detailed record from, from the Sentinel data. We've got eight, eight mosaics there. Um, these mosaics have been used for quite a lot of mapping. Um, the, they get used for national mapping exercises. Here's some examples here. We produce um, the forestry land use map for, for MFE, and, and these particular central mosaics have been used for the one in 2016, and we are currently mapping the 2020 version of that map on 2021 mosaic. We also produce LCDB regularly, and LCDB has been LCB 2018 has been produced off that mosaic. And right now, um, the discussions are ahead as to when the next LCB will be produced. There's an opportunity to do it over last summer's mosaic, but then the Cyclone Gabrielle um, effects might mean it might be more practical to wait till those changes have happened and do it over next summer's mosaic. So that's still in discussion. Um, we also have done annual forestry loss change checking through this period. And, and just recently, we've also used our Sentinel data to do some rapid assessment of landsliding in the uh, post cyclone Gabriel. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's the content I want to discuss today. Thanks very much, James. Uh, that was fascinating. I always think I understand our work until I, until I hear you guys uh, talk about it in more depth and, and that's uh, that's been great. Now we have got some really super technical questions, and so I just want to say to to the people that have popped those in, we will come back to you rather than try and tackle some of those more technical things uh, on the spot uh, when we haven't really got that much time. But here's a really interesting one, and this is something that lots of people do ask me as well. Um, are there any risks? with relying directly on Sentinel-2 views that are available directly from online sources, particularly for floods and vegetation analysis, rather than the kind of analysis that you're doing? Well, I don't think there are risks. It just, it's, 
because we've calibrated this to reflectance, we can do rules and apply rules across dates. I mean, if you get imagery from, from any source and you do local training in that particular imagery for that purpose, I, I don't think there's any risks. But it, it means that you sort of have to do that each time. And so it's a bit more work involved. But um, whereas we're trying to be able to roll methods out that will work through time without having to retrain each time you get the data. So no, I, I think the data is fine. I just, I haven't found the cloud clearing as useful as ours. And I and we like to have access to the, our own archive for the reflectance calibration, so. Great. Um, a quick question on land cover classification. How many classes do we have? How many classes do we have? Well, I think there's 33 in the LCDB. Um, I mean, I guess the world's our oyster really in terms of classifying, if we've got training and new new techniques like rule-based classification like we've done historically and, and artificial intelligence type deep learning, if we have enough training, we've got lots of opportunity to do more classes. But yeah, the current, there's the current number of classes, land cover classes is 33. Yeah. Great. Um, do the mosaics that you've showed us and talked about here use all the spectral bands from Sentinel-2? Um, there's 13 spectral bands in Sentinel-2, um, but three of them are 60 meter resolution. So these mosaics have 10 spectral bands um, and the there's a combination of 10 and 20 meter um, size uh, resolution pixels in there, but we have I've got a, a pan sharpening technique that pan sharpens the 20 meter to 10. So basically they're 10 of the 13 spectral bands and they're 10 meter resolution. Great, thanks. Um, and just one last question, what software do you use for mosaic processing? Um, we use a combination of um, our own code, um, Python libraries and and some individual C code, yeah. So um, the uh, some of the technical informations in the papers and for example the the um, segmentation algorithm is is freely available and if you follow that paper. But yeah, a combination of of C software and Python Python code and libraries. Great. Look, we're going to uh, finish on time. Uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to everyone for those great questions. Um, some of them are long, some of them are quite technical. We will come back to you on, on those, um, those topics. And the Q&As along with James's presentation will appear on our website at a, at a future date. Tomorrow we have another in our series and Brent Martin will be telling us all about how remote sensing and AI is helping us to stay one step ahead of pests in the landscape. If you haven't already registered, check the link in the email that will, will follow up on this section, session and uh, register for tomorrow. And we'll say goodbye for now and see you tomorrow. <laughs>